Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, Ottawa says there should be vaccines for Christmas. Newfoundland and Labrador is one of the 14 vaccine distribution sites, thank God. Provinces begin spelling out who will get them first. One thing that we can urgently do is simply do more testing. Findings from a new long-term care home report. I definitely, definitely feel uh, almost defeated at times. The stress of COVID-19 on Canadian GPs. I just want to let you know, Mariam, you are the winner. Oh my God. And an Alberta high schooler wins a global science contest. We're going to tell my dad the, the big news. Don't worry about tuition, Dad. She just won a quarter of a million bucks. This is The National. Well, in the fight against COVID-19, Canada will soon have new weapons to fight back. The first doses of the Pfizer vaccine should be here soon, earlier than anticipated. The Prime Minister says a quarter of a million by the end of December, the start of an inoculation campaign that will stretch well into 2021. Welcome news to be sure, but far from the tens of millions of doses required to get things back to normal in this country. Now, receiving vaccines and then getting them into people's arms are two very different things. David Cochran shows us what we know so far. We're not out of the crisis yet, but now vaccines are coming. It's the news Canadians have been waiting for. First shipments of the Pfizer vaccine should soon be here. Pending Health Canada approval, the first shipment of doses is tracking for delivery next week. Those deliveries will bring up to 249,000 doses before the end of December. At two doses per person, that's enough for about 125,000 Canadians, with the provinces getting per capita shares. We're still very far from having the millions of vaccines we need for mass immunization. Another factor, Pfizer's vaccine is delicate and needs to be stored at extremely cold temperatures, which means it will only ship to 14 distribution centers, which have the freezers and the people to handle it. Newfoundland and Labrador is one of the 14 vaccine distribution sites Prime Minister Trudeau just announced. Thank God. A sentiment others may soon express, as once the provinces get their doses, the first people can quickly get their shots. It's a matter of a day or two, uh, is my understanding. So that's a relatively um, fast process. Those first needles just the first steps toward the goal of 3 million Canadians vaccinated by the end of March and then ramping up throughout 2021. A long process that was expected to start in January, now potentially just days away. Until uh, we are able to sit down here today uh, and announce uh, firm uh, delivery pending the final approval by uh, Health Canada, uh, we uh, wanted not to get people's hopes up. Okay, so David, correct me if I'm wrong, those initial doses are only going to the provinces, right? So, so what's happening with the territories and indigenous communities? Yeah, so the Pfizer vaccine is a real challenge for the north and for remote communities. It can destabilize if it's moved too much. It needs to be stored at minus 70, so it's not a great traveler. And what that means is, is that the territories and remote indigenous communities, they're going to have to wait for sturdier vaccines like the Moderna vaccine, which is easier to ship, easier to store, easier to handle. And it's important to note that Major General Fortan said today that that is what the territories requested uh, based on their limited capacities and also that the Prime Minister promised that remote northern and indigenous communities will get priority to doses of those next easier to travel vaccines. David Cochran, thank you very much. You got it. Quebec is set to receive up to 4,000 initial vaccine doses next week. Its health minister says many will go immediately to long-term care residents, those hit hardest by COVID-19. Those four boxes will allow us to vaccinate 2,000 people. They will be deployed in uh, two CHSLD, so that's really our first test. Dubé says up to 28,000 Quebecers should be immunized by January 4th as more doses come in. At the top of the list, people in long-term care homes, private seniors' homes, and those in isolated and Indigenous communities. This is a plan similar to Ontario. We will go, for example, towards the people in long-term care homes who are in the hot zones. And we'll go into places where the government of Ontario has had to offer their support in the past, uh, past nine months or so. 
and that includes vulnerable seniors along with their care workers, adults in Indigenous communities and retirement homes, and those who receive chronic home health care. All are part of the first of a three-phase plan to vaccinate this province. Phase one is expected to take two or three months, depending on how fast Ontario gets its doses. Long-term care homes account for four out of five COVID deaths in Canada. One of the biggest operators of those homes has reviewed what went wrong during the first wave of the, of the pandemic. And as Ellen Morrow tells us, it points the finger of blame elsewhere. My grandfather is the most resilient, strong and gracious human being I think I will ever know. That's made it even harder for Emily Lakowitz to be separated from 90-year-old Heinz Zebel, locked down in a Rivera-run home in Ottawa where COVID has claimed 61 lives. We have seen uh, declines in him um, physically, emotionally. He certainly expresses to me daily that he is lonely. A loneliness only deepening as the second wave grows. Today, Rivera, one of Canada's largest long-term care operators, looked back on the first wave, releasing this report detailing the perfect storm leading to the pandemic's toll in the spring when 286 Rivera residents died across Canada. Chronic understaffing, multi-resident rooms, and delays in getting protective gear to homes made for a deadly mix, says the report. Its authors are urging all provinces to start testing anyone entering a long-term care facility. One thing that we can urgently do to protect long-term care residents is simply do more testing. The report places much of the blame on provincial governments and public health officials. Rivera itself comes out relatively unscathed, even as the provider faces a class action lawsuit alleging negligence. They are not innocent from any of the outcomes that have come out of the first wave. It is their ultimate responsibility to keep their workers safe, to keep their residents safe. If you are understaffed, if you are underpaid, if you're undertrained, how is anybody supposed to do the best job possible? A pressing question fueling her anxiety. I'm scared that I will never be able to hug my grandfather again. I am scared that he's going to die alone. But they do all they can to make sure their grandfather never feels alone. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. In Ontario, daily case rates lead the country and are still trending up. And the government is warning that turning things around will depend on actions taken in the coming days. I know people are um, looking forward to the vaccine being ready and may see it as a situation that you don't need to take care anymore. You really, really do. Ontario's health minister telling people to enjoy Christmas with members of the immediate household only. The number of new cases today, 1,925. So that makes three straight days of record-breaking numbers. When we think of the medical impact of the virus, we may think of ventilators, of overflowing emergency rooms and ICUs. But COVID-19 touches family doctors too. Vicodopia shows us that family practices under pressure mean pressure throughout the system. He's a new doctor in one of Canada's poorest neighbourhoods, known as Park X, which has high rates of COVID-19. I'm not going to lie, I'm definitely, uh, I am definitely feel uh, almost defeated at times. Asylum seekers and recent immigrants are a big part of Shirwani's practice. Most patients consult with him over the phone, which is a struggle, not just because of language, but trying to diagnose symptoms when he can't examine his patients. Now what I'm, I'm seeing is when, you know, people are consulting with abdominal issues, is that I'm going straight to ordering ultrasounds, straight to ordering blood tests. Um, and I know that's also a strain on the system. Remote family medicine has improved access to health care for some. But this psychiatrist who treats other doctors says many are more worried than ever about their patients. Just to get those nuances that, you know, would be much readily uh, uh, seen in person, but you, you don't want to miss anything. You want to make sure that uh, you fully understand what the patient is saying without uh, the help of all the body language you would have in the office. An even bigger challenge when patients are elderly, like this doctor's. She's crying. Mood-wise, how do you think she is? 
Dr. Iris Gorfinkel says she's also sending her patients for more frequent tests and referrals. And wait times for x-rays, ultrasounds and blood tests are getting longer. That's on top of the long-term needs of some COVID patients. Instantly, you're, you're referring to a cardiologist. You're referring to a respirologist. Like, do the math in your mind about what's happening. They're, they're, they may have some blood problems, so it could be a hematologist. If they've lost their sense of smell or taste, you're talking about a neurologist. Which often leads to more tests in a system that's already taxed. Blood test for acquisition. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Well, British Columbia is extending its widespread ban on social gatherings through the holiday season. If you're used to having multiple family members come and go over Christmas and getting together and having those large dinners together, now you need to do it remotely. These holidays are going to be different and they need to be different. The announcement comes as the province registered 2,020 new cases over the past three days, along with 35 new deaths. Meanwhile, officials are looking into a COVID-19 outbreak at a mink farm in BC's Fraser Valley. It's unclear how the virus was transmitted, but concerns are growing because the virus has been known to spread between mink and humans. Greg Rasmussen explains. BC's Fraser Valley has 14 mink farms and eight people on one of them have tested positive for COVID-19. Authorities aren't releasing the location, but say the farm is locked down. So it is of great concern for us, and we are working closely with WorkSafe BC to ensure that all of the measures on the farm are being done appropriately. In Denmark, 17 million animals were culled after it was found COVID-19 was going back and forth between mink and people, mutating along the way. The fear is those mutations could make the virus resistant to vaccines and treatments. Our antibodies that we are going to develop by vaccination or natural exposure may not work because the, now the, the structure of the virus changed and now it's not recognized by the antibodies. Testing is underway to see if the disease has spread from the BC workers into the mink at the farm. About a million mink pelts are produced in Canada every year. Industry representatives say biosecurity is taken seriously and the risk to people is low. Fortunately, we see some activist groups that have long opposed mink farming and, and, and would like to end it, who are jumping on this and exploiting this situation for their own purposes to try to say we should just shut down the mink farms. The United States has had several outbreaks on mink farms, but no widespread cull. This lab in Wisconsin is involved in testing and tracing the disease. We get very concerned about viruses moving back and forth between people and animals. What's their absolute risk of mink? I think the jury is still out on that. Um, we haven't noticed the mutations that the, the Danish saw. He says it's important because mink and their relatives are similar to humans in ways that make them vulnerable to COVID-19 and other respiratory infections. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. For PEI, the goal isn't just to keep people from getting critically ill. It is to keep COVID off the island entirely. And by that measure, today there is some evidence there's a problem. Another four new cases were announced. Too many when the aim is COVID zero. The island has now seen more cases in the past week than it had in the preceding seven. At testing centers today, long lineups after officials asked every Charlottetown resident in their 20s to get tested. The hunt is on to find every chain of transmission and break it. Now, staying in Atlanta, Canada, reaction remains divided tonight after three people were charged Friday in connection to the deadly mass shooting in Nova Scotia this past April. Kayla Hounsel takes a closer look. The gunman's common law partner told police she escaped his attack and hid in the woods while chaos erupted around her. In the following days, the RCMP described her as a victim. It was a significant incident. It was a significant assault. Now the Mounties say they have charged Lisa Banfield, her brother and brother-in-law, with providing the gunman with ammunition. But police say the three didn't have any prior knowledge of Gabriel Wortman's actions. We've gotten contact from feminists all across Canada really upset. This advocate says she's concerned about the message. Banfield is suing Wortman's estate. In her statement of claim, she said she suffered physical, emotional and psychological injuries. Often women who are in abusive relationships are coerced 
into criminal activity and how this is going to be a chilling effect on women that are in uh, extremely violent relationships, trusting the police and coming forward. But for the families of the 22 victims, news of the charges is welcome. Uh, they have very little information um, about anything. Um, there's a sense of, of relief. Um, many of the families felt that, um, you know, the um, Banfield part of, of the story has been a missing piece of the puzzle. This criminologist says charging a victim is fraught with problems. I think the public will expect uh, any surviving people who assisted the shooter uh, be held accountable. And I think that's very reasonable. The RCMP is refusing to talk about any of this, citing a pending public inquiry. I don't see how providing clarity on some key issues of public interest is a disservice to um, what may or may not come out in a forthcoming inquiry. The inquiry will examine the police response to the shootings, the steps they took to inform victims' families and the public, and the role of gender-based violence. The final report is not expected for another two years. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, police in Toronto have charged a man in connection with two nooses left at a construction site. They were found by two black workers back in June. On Friday, police arrested 34-year-old Jason LaHaye, who is now facing several counts of criminal harassment. Police say they're investigating similar incidents across the city. A group of academics at the University of Windsor has called today a day of mourning, triggered by what they say is an institutional problem with racism. As Chris Ensing explains, some students are reporting not just a climate of discrimination, but now one of fear. I myself have had issues of anti-black racism in the law school, being harassed. Josh Lamers is vocal about his experience as a black student on campus, calling for change met by death threats that the University of Windsor is now investigating. You know, it, it, I feel pretty unsafe, and if this isn't dealt with properly, my question is, is this about to be the next year and a half I have left at University of Windsor? There have been a series of incidents at this school this year. Two professors have apologized for using the N-word in class while discussing course material. And police are investigating members of this fraternity, now permanently closed for allegedly making sexist and racist remarks. A black student was banned from campus while the school investigated a fight. The university later concluded he acted in self-defense and apologized, but the other student was never punished. And they're all part of a spectrum to me. Hence, we need a day of mourning to educate white people and people who don't notice the racism against black people to tell them like, hey, just because you don't notice it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. As student groups on campus, we are, are witnessing in, in its entirety how, um, you know, black student voices, their, their voices are being ignored. The university says it is taking steps to combat anti-black racism, including hiring 12 black faculty members by 2023, adding it's clear that we need to move faster. It comes after continued calls by faculty groups for change and acknowledgement of the cost this has for black students. What we're forgetting is that Putting these issues on the table actually has costs for them, right? From their reputation in terms of their future careers to how their community is reacting to them. Faculty call the steps taken by the school slow but encouraging. They want to see things sped up. If not, the days of mourning will continue, hinting that activism will ramp up. Chris Ensing, CBC News, Windsor. National Chief Perry Bellegarde of the Assembly of First Nations has said he won't seek re-election next summer. Bellegarde has led the organization for six years. The Prime Minister today called him a tireless advocate. The Assembly of First Nations represents more than 600 communities. Well, tonight we continue our investigation into Canada's pandemic spending. It was the largest amount of money we've ever received in our bank account. Ahead on the National, we follow the money and turn up some questions about how the cash was handed out. Donald Trump appears to dump Fox News and find a new favorite. They're primarily producing propaganda. And the Alberta high schooler who just won a quarter million dollars. I just had a lot of time over quarantine and I just uh, decided to enter. The pandemic science project that paid off. We're back in two.
Welcome back. So we've learned Canada will get its first COVID-19 vaccines before the end of the month. It's a step one of a much larger rollout, but it wasn't that long ago Canada was faced with a similar challenge. Now think back to 2009. That's when the world was hit by H1N1. Maybe you remember it as swine flu. The scale of that pandemic was very different. Even by the end, officially recorded deaths in Canada in the hundreds, not the thousands. But at the time, Canada launched what was its largest immunization effort ever. It was ambitious, but it hit bumps in the road almost immediately. Canada was relying on just one vaccine manufacturer for starters, which meant a limited supply. It also lacked the manpower to get those vaccines into people, which meant long waits. So what lessons have we learned? And how might this pandemic's vaccine rollout be different? Well, Dr. Allison McGeer is an infectious diseases specialist and knows exactly what healthcare providers were faced with during H1N1 because she was there. Uh, Dr. McGeer, hello to you. Maybe I'll just start with the first question of what keeps you up at night this time around, this pandemic, this vaccine rollout? So what, what actually worries me the most about this vaccine rollout is how well we'll do about getting information to Canadians so they're confident in the vaccine. The, the logistics we can handle. It'll be pain. There will be long waits. There's all sorts of bad things that go with it, but it's all manageable. But this is a new vaccine. It's different than vaccines we've tried before. People are going to be worried about it. And we need to get a lot of information to a lot of people in a really short period of time to make this vaccination program work. So, see, so that answer actually surprises me a little bit. I, I expected the logistics to be the heavier lift here. I mean, even just in manufacturing and procurement. I mean, uh, sure, we, we've got several international suppliers, so maybe lots of eggs in lots of different baskets. But without any real direct control over any of them. Isn't that concerning? Well, of course, everything's a concern and, and logistics and procurement are, are really challenging. I, I didn't say they were gonna be easy. You just asked me what was <laughs> I most worried, all right? It, it is gonna be hard, but on the other hand, we've got a lot of good people working on it um, and and a lot of will to to make the system work. So is it gonna be bumpy? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's not gonna go perfectly smoothly, but it, it will go. On the other hand, people's anxieties about getting the vaccine, particularly when we've all kind of gotten a little bit used to COVID. It's not as scary as it used to be. Mm. Doesn't seem as dangerous in some ways. Um, may mean that, that we have a hard time getting information to people so that they get their vaccine. Are, are there more differences between H1N1 and COVID than similarities? I mean, like, are, are there sort of direct lessons that, that you can think of or that we can draw from, you know, a little over 10 years ago and apply them this time around? So, yeah, for sure, there are lessons. You know, that, that was a very big program. It was run primarily by public health. I think the people who did logistics for the 2009 program and, and figured out how to get those clinics up and running, that's very useful, no question. On the other hand, this was a very different vaccine. You know, we the regular flu vaccine, although it felt like it took a while to come, it was actually only a matter of weeks to get all of the vaccine uh, availability in. And so th this is going to be much more challenging because it's going to go on for longer. We're going to have to be more targeted in our initial vaccine use. Vaccine storage is a big issue. Getting two doses into people is another big mm. problem with it. So um, this is actually a much bigger logistical challenge than, than we faced in 2009. Dr. McGeer, your insights are always needed and appreciated. Thank you for your time. Pleasure to talk to you. Take care. Next, we continue to track the federal government's pandemic spending. It was the largest amount of money we've ever received in our bank account. A CBC News investigation continues to follow hundreds of billions of dollars right after the break. I think these koalas are symbolic to so many people. 14 koalas badly burned in Australia's bushfires earlier this year are back in the wild. They'd been airlifted out for months of treatment and recovery. Then, after getting their climbing strength back, they were fitted with tracking collars and brought back home. A senior vet described seeing the koalas run up a tree as just the best. Welcome back. COVID-19 has pushed federal spending to record levels, and a CBC News investigation is tracking that money. The big spend looks at the $240 billion allocated 
in the pandemic's first eight months. We have two stories from that investigation for you tonight, starting with Shana Luck on the impact millions of dollars have made to women's shelters across the country and how one small team may have found a new way of supporting them. For 10 months, Caitlin geiger Bardswitch has been working from her Ottawa home to fight a pandemic, but not COVID-19. Some have called it the shadow pandemic, domestic violence, a threat making lockdown a dangerous time for women. The federal minister for women put it starkly. And his most powerful tool, isolation, is now endorsed by the state. The government knew it had to get money to women's shelters, fast, but how? Soon the phone rang at Women's Shelters Canada. Would they take on distributing $20 million to their network of 500 shelters? It was the largest amount of money we've ever received in our bank account. Women's Shelters Canada does research and advocacy, not funding. This was entirely new, but they got to work. You know, as only five people, we were a small but mighty team and that we could do it if we put in a bit of the extra hours, like we could physically do it. They contacted shelters like this one in Shediac, New Brunswick, where the funds helped pay for PPE and more staff to answer desperate calls. If they're not able to leave the house and the perpetrator's there, you know, they're making a phone call to us and hiding in their closet. So it becomes really difficult. Women's Shelters Canada distributed between $32,000 and $90,000 to shelters, depending on what services each offered. The only exceptions were shelters in Indigenous communities and in Quebec, which also got money, but through a different process. People who work in the sector are applauding how quickly the money flowed and the way it slashed away red tape. It was historic, you know, where, you know, they had this money and needed to disperse it to all the shelters across Canada. It was a unique process. A process that's soon to be repeated. There is more money to come before Christmas, after the federal government announced a further $50 million to shelters and sexual assault centres. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. The Indigenous tourism industry was considered one of Canada's fastest growing sectors until COVID-19. Now, Ottawa offered $16 million to help, but as Jorge Barrera shows us, many are now questioning how the money was doled out. <laughs> <laughs> a mischievous nudge from an Ojibwe spirit horse at TJ Stables in southern Ontario. None of these horses have ever had a rope on them. Owners Terry and John Jenkins made tough choices. To protect their prize herd, they sold off other breeds as business plunged amid the pandemic. We sold 20 horses. Imagine that. Like many in their industry, they asked the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, known as ITAC, for help. A group tapped by the federal government to administer $16 million in relief funds. We had about 830 or so applications in the country. ITAC got to work. Their first order of business, a $25,000 bonus for CEO Keith Henry. He says the money was part of a new employment deal and fair. Well, I think what the board did is they got an independent opinion about what was fair market for my position. For some, Henry's and ITAC's work was a lifesaver. That stimulus basically kept our heads above water. But others saw problems. Suggestions that the funds were shared unequally across provinces. This founding ITAC board member filed a formal complaint with the federal government after he crunched the numbers himself. So it didn't seem to be a level playing field. Manitoba did, Nova Scotia did. And there was a question of money that simply came too late. We didn't receive the funds until late October. Well, our entire tourism season is over. On the Walpole Island Reserve, the border shutdown devastated Josh White's outfitter operation. He only received his full promised $25,000 in November. When someone tells you you're getting a check in two weeks and that's in September, the whole uncertainty of it all is just, it gets to you. Henry says there's a simple explanation. I mean, this was a very significant amount of volume of work for basically the handful of staff that we have. It's a pandemic and we're trying desperately to save our, our businesses in any way we can. Indigenous Services Canada says it's reviewing the complaints against ITAC to determine whether they warrant a full investigation. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Ottawa.
You can find more on the big spend on our website, including a detailed breakdown of which programs got how much of that $240 billion in spending. It is all at cbc.ca slash news. Now, COVID-19 has generated so many personal stories, and we're capturing some in a series that we think of as pandemic diaries. Tonight's comes from Raf Chaudhry, whose small business is pushing through a second lockdown. Hi, I'm Raf Chaudhry from Baseline Sports here in North York, Toronto. When the pandemic first struck and we got put into lockdown, it was a difficult time. Uh, we offer training, retail, and we had to stop all those services. We didn't know what we needed to do to take the next steps, other than that we knew we had to pivot some way. We service a lot of local baseball organizations. We made it through the year because of our great support from our community. Now that we're in a second lockdown, we're better informed, we're, we're better planned. Our leadership team made sure that we were ready to go um, for this for the second round of lockdown but uh, don't get me wrong this is it, it still hurts a lot it's not easy to uh, to shut your doors down and and you know just just call it a day for a month and a half we'll get through this as long as we do it for each other um, stay together stay strong stay positive next why Donald Trump appears to be changing the channel on Fox News Look, Susan, I, I'm not a journalist. I don't pretend to be one, and I've said that over and over again. The idea is to inform viewers. What's really behind a shift in the president and his supporters right after the break? But first, after 70 years, IKEA is retiring its popular paper catalog, citing its environmental priorities and the global trend towards online shopping. At its peak in 2016, IKEA printed more than 200 million copies in dozens of languages around the world. But these days, it seems more people prefer to point and click than to brave those long lineups. Honestly, who can blame them? Though COVID-19 restrictions have also changed the game a bit. The Swedish furniture giant says its 2021 issue released this past summer will be its last. Rudy's doing well. I just spoke to him. He's doing very well. No temperature. Of course, Donald Trump is talking about his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, who is being treated in hospital for COVID-19. That will sideline him from his losing effort to overturn the results of last month's presidential election. It is a safe bet Trump won't leave the presidency quietly and that he will continue to use the media to help make his case. But there is speculation he's seeking a new, friendlier outlet. Our senior correspondent, Susan Ormiston, looks at some potential choices. President Trump refusing to concede. Inside the White House, President Trump still fumes. Don't talk to me that way. You're just a, you're just a lightweight. Don't Railing talk against that. the 2020 result, calling out traitors and commending his patriots as the media continue to critique his failure to concede. Will he ever concede? Even Fox News. Arizona. Should. Are you 100% sure of that call? The first on election night to call Arizona for Biden, which sent Trump into a fury. Since then, a steady stream of tweets denigrating Fox. Fox News daytime ratings have completely collapsed. They forgot the golden goose, urging his followers to change the channel. Fox News daytime, virtually unwatchable. Watch OAN and Newsmax or almost anything else and retweeting actor Randy Quaid's bizarre video. Fox News daytime ratings have completely collapsed. Good evening, welcome to Washington. Fox, the number one cable channel, has certainly not collapsed, but in Trump land, hardcore loyalists are disgruntled. Even Fox News is crooked. After the election, supporters surged into Washington. Tens of thousands, their loyalty firm, some eager to switch to media that parrots Trump's claims. The vote was stolen and he won. We are seeing a shift that is coming from a kind of revolt against the conservative media establishment. And we see that mostly with something like Fox News. Nicole Hemmer, a political historian, has written extensively about conservative media and the far right. And that is really empowering 
these other right-wing outlets, Newsmax, um, One American News on television, but even conservative talk radio as well, to kind of go after Fox and try to claim to be a better authority, a better version of conservative media um, than Fox News is. And when you say better, in their eyes, what's better? Um, it's more pro-Trump. Graham Ledger. Don't believe this garbage in the mainstream media. OAN, One America News, is a digital channel on the conservative fringe. Newsmax, a small cable player, Trump's promotion is pumping up Newsmax numbers. Programs like Greg Kelly's show, which reached over a million the week after the election. The mainstream media relentlessly convincing us, trying to at least, that this thing is over. How many times have they tried to convince us that Donald Trump was finished? Also on Newsmax, Spicer and Company, co-hosted by the former White House press secretary, Sean Spicer. We saw an absolutely uh, astronomical rise uh, starting the week before the election. You remember Spicer, who in his first briefing chastised the press for misreporting the size uh, of Trump's inaugural crowd. These attempts to lessen the enthusiasm of the inauguration are shameful and wrong. After six months, he was out, wrote a couple of books, and did a spin on Dancing with the Stars. He started his talk show on Newsmax in March. I wonder, Lindsay, if we knew what we know today in terms of vaccines, the stock market, and so much more, how much different the election would be. Look, Susan, I, I'm not a journalist. I don't pretend to be one, and I've said that over and over again. The idea is to inform viewers, plain and simple, but I'm not, I, I'm very clear about where I stand personally. I work for the president. I work for the Republican National Committee. I'm a proud conservative, um, but we have Democrats on the show all the time. Did President Trump lose this election? My thought is he's got a case. Whether or not it's strong or not, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I haven't seen the evidence. What I'm trying to get at, Sean, is whether you believe that Joe Biden is the president-elect at this juncture. If the president overturns these electoral votes in this thing because of some impropriety, because of a constitutional question, what have you, then he will have won. Does that likely? I think it's an uphill battle. There's no question about it. But does he have a legal right to pursue these challenges? Yes. Newsmax's CEO Chris Ruddy is close to Trump, who called him two weeks ago to congratulate. Just incredible the ratings you're getting. Newsmax still not acknowledging Trump lost. What's happening inside Newsmax? Is this going to be a vehicle for Donald Trump when he leaves the White House? Chris has been building up Newsmax for quite some time, and I think he, uh, he as he's mentioned in the past, he's uh, love having the president come on as a guest in some shape, way, shape, or form, or, but he, he's not looking for a, a partnership. Behind barricades and construction for Biden's inauguration, Trump continues to peddle he is not the loser. And there's a ready audience. Conservative media is growing and splintering. These are pretty fringe networks in a lot of ways. They don't have a strong reporting wing. Um, they're primarily producing propaganda. And having more and more Americans consuming more and more propaganda is a real problem for our political system. I mean, we're going to see this in the aftermath of the 2020 election, the millions of Americans who won't see Joe Biden's presidency as legitimate. I'm the president of the United States. Don't ever talk to the president that way. But Trump's time as president is almost up determined to rewrite his ending. By all indications today, the president wants to keep fighting all the way to the Supreme Court. He continues to jack up election conspiracies and hype the media who will help him. All right, going forward, Susan, how do you expect Trump to actually use those platforms when he's out of office? Well, firstly, important to note, he's not going away. He will leave the White House in January or before and go to Mar-a-Lago. But from there, he will continue to use this conservative media to help keep his really incomparable political brand alive. During his presidency, the demand for conservative right-wing media has only increased. So he will pick and choose among them, depending on what he's trying to sell, whether that is as a Republican kingmaker or as a potential candidate going into the 2024 election, which he has been hinting about in the last few weeks. 
As for Fox, once Biden gets in the White House, they will resume a very familiar footing as kind of the official or unofficial, really, opposition. So with like-minded conservative media, they will be keeping a very close eye on this government, and that has worked very handily for them in the past. But don't expect Donald Trump to fade away, of course. He will not remain on the outside in the media platforms at all. All right, senior correspondent Susan Ormiston in Washington. Thanks, Susan. And next, the Alberta high school student who just won a life-changing prize. We're going to tell my dad the, the big news. I won the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. Her award-winning science video right after the break. <laughs> For the latest coronavirus pandemic updates, breaking news, and top stories, download the CBC News app now. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, how the push to break up big tech is bolstered by the fight against COVID-19. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, the name of the science contest, the Breakthrough Junior Challenge, might not convey just how big a deal it is, but it's a big deal. It had more than 5,000 entrants globally, and the top prize, a college scholarship of a quarter of a million dollars U.S. This year, the winner is from Fort McMurray, Alberta, and the CBC's Jamie Malbouf shows us how she pulled it off, starting with her winning video. Imagine if you could walk through walls in real life, and it turns out you can, at a quantum level. Miriam Sutguy spent two weeks feverishly working on a three-minute video about quantum tunneling. She used dice and video games to help explain the phenomenon. Force the electron to let go of the dice. It was a submission for the Breakthrough Junior Challenge, an international competition that asked students to explain a complicated scientific topic to the general public. Sutguy was one of more than 5,600 students to enter around the world. Uh, well, I just had a lot of time over quarantine, and I just... Uh, decided to enter and previous years I always hesitated from entering because I was really intimidated by all the other competitors. Sukai's school in Fort McMurray was asked to help announce her as the winner of the $500,000 prize. When I first heard I literally had to have the lady tell me a few times on the phone because I didn't even really completely believe it. Sukai's principal invited her and a few friends to the school supposedly to film a promotional video. Instead, the judges of the prestigious competition appeared on screen to tell her the news. Maybe to speak directly to Mariam. And, you know, I just want to let you know, Mariam, you are the winner for oh this year's Breakthrough oh Junior Challenge, the $250,000 scholarship, the $100,000 science lab for your school, the $50,000 uh, for your uh, teacher. They are yours. It was an emotional moment for this 17-year-old. We're going to tell my dad the, the big news. I won the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. Oh, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> this multi-talented grade 12 student says she's going to use the money to go to university abroad next year. And, as you may have guessed, she plans to study physics. Jamie Malbeth, CBC News, Fort McMurray, Alberta. That huh. is so great. Yeah. Next on the National, it's the candy no one knows how to pronounce. The story behind why a Saskatchewan Canadian tire is selling thousands of boxes of it. Next to normal. Well, Malcolm Jenkins is the owner of the Canadian Tire in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and each year he sells a ridiculous amount of candy. But not just any candy. It is a very specific kind of treat, and no matter what you call it, it's tonight's moment. There's no other store in the world, in the known universe or the chartered galaxy, that it sells this much toffee fee. We're the single largest selling store in the world. It's a tradition really now, almost. People say, when, in October, they'll say, when's the toffee fee coming? It's sort of got a life of its own now. It's, uh, it, we put it on the sign by the road, we say, it's back. And they know what it is, they don't say what's back. The toffee fee returns to Prince Albert. And then when it comes in, we put the mountain of it at the front. We say, here we are, we're back on Toffee Fee Mountain. Lifetime Achievement Award, presented to Canadian Tire Prince Albert. Pretty proud about that. I polish it like once a year. And each year we've allocated it to a different charity. We, 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 did, we donate a dollar for each box that we sell. This year it's the Rose Garden Hospice. We're halfway towards building a hospice here in town. 
question comes up every year. People go, can I have some toffee fee or toffee fee or toffee fee? There's about, I think there's about five different uh, pronunciations. As long as they buy it, I don't care what they call it. <laughs> and what's the right pronunciation? Again? I have no <laughs> idea. I, I will get it wrong every time. Listen, a big shout out to Bonnie Allen, our reporter oh. in Saskatchewan, who said, I think you guys need to take a look at this. And then she did some digging. There are 36,000 people there, but they bought 29,000 boxes last year. Which raises a lot of money, like yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. And for all kinds of local community initiatives, they've raised money for a skate park, mm -hmm. a splash pad in the past. So in the hospice pretty, this year. Yeah, pretty stellar work there. Uh, hey, that's The National for this December 7th. Have a great night. Good night.